Welcome back to the next installment of Econ Online on YouTube. Uh, today we'll be talking about Chapter 1, Section 1. I'll be sending you uh, Chapter 2, Sections 2 and 3 for you to use your book so you can crack that open for once. Uh, this lesson is usually much more fun, I think, in class because we're interacting together, but this is what we're left with, so we'll do this. Now, to start off, I have three words I would like you to take a moment and try to give me synonyms, other words that mean the same thing. I'm actually going to pause for a second and let you try to come up with at least one word that's a synonym for each one of those. So, please give it a try. Sometimes it's much easier when you have a group at your table doing this, but it's okay. Then we usually would uh, have students just give examples of words. So let's just start with the word tradition. Sometimes the other things that students come up with are things like custom or something that's annual. Many times we have annual traditions we do. Uh, a lot of times they're passed down from generation to generation and then sometimes it's more like you know it's a ritual you do certain things at a certain time you go to grandma's house for this holiday or you celebrate holidays in this particular fashion for the word command most of the time students come up with things like order a command is an order a directive or a demand and a lot of times you're, you know, there's an obligation involved. You must do something because it's a command. Market's a little bit harder. Uh, students have said you know, a lot of times a market or market sometimes is uh, buying and sell. You're buying and selling something. Uh, maybe it's market can also be the word advertise to market something. A lot of times there's goods and services are involved. And then a lot of times we came up, you know, students will come up with examples of markets. Like uh, you have a flea market, <laughs> you have the black market, you could have the stock market, which has been very volatile lately with the coronavirus. You can have a supermarket. So all those are just different examples. Now, why do I have students do this? Why do your tables do this? This is a much better way of explaining something than if I just told you the answer. You've now, by defining or giving synonyms for these three particular words, you've actually come up with the very, very good definitions of the three types of economies there are in the world. There are traditional economies where it's ruled by custom and it's annual, it's passed down, it's like a ritual. There are some economies that are command, where there's orders given, directives, and people are told what to do. Market, it's buying and selling, advertising, goods and services, a little bit more free flowing. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna quickly go through and tell and talk about the advantages and disadvantages of each of these different types of economies there are in the world. So you'd have your piece of paper out that has this, whether you printed it or just going to write down, this is, a, I've blown it up so we can really see it easily, but it has the three types of economies, traditional, command, and market, and then we're going to put down their strengths and weaknesses. Now the first thing we're, we're going to do is going to kind of summarize the three, because each one of these uh, economies is characteristic of certain types of countries also. So usually when you have a traditional economy where it's you know, passed down, it's ritual, blah, 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 usually we refer to those, we used to refer to those as third world. 
third world economies, that's not really uh, politically correct anymore. A lot of times what we talk about now is there are countries that are emerging. They're emerging economies. Okay, so traditional third world economies. Uh, for command, we refer to as second world. And one where there's, it's command, where there's orders given and stuff, and people are obligated, they must do it. We all know that that is communist. And then, of course, on, on market, that's the kind that we have, and it's first world. So we have a first world economy. So let's start by talking about the strengths and weaknesses of a third world or what we call a traditional, where tradition dominates, where you're doing kind of the same things. Things are passed down over and over. So what could be something that might be a strength of that? Well, many of you you're getting close to graduation and some of you your future may not be really really set in stone it could be fluid some of you know exactly what you want to do but others don't so it's kind of I don't know what I'm gonna do with my future you know what am I gonna uh, do for college or work or what's my career going to be so it's kind of in the air but in a traditional economy there isn't any of that because you're going to do what if you're a male you're gonna do what your father did who's doing what his grandfather did and if you're a female you're gonna do what your mother did it's passed down so that means there are certain certain economic roles for everyone Everyone has an economic role. You're going to do what's passed down. And that also means, in addition, life is usually stable, predictable, and the word continuous. Stable, predictable, and continuous life. Life goes on. You're going to do the same thing. There's no ambiguity. You have a role to play. So things keep going on and on and on where our economy is a little bit more volatile. Your career, your future may not be set in stone. What are the weaknesses of that kind of economy though? Well, if things have been passed down, it usually discourages new ideas. They've done things a certain way for a long time, so it's very hard to come up with new ways of doing things. They've been, you know, if you come to your, your dad and tell him, oh, I know of a new way of doing this, the dad goes, Psh, hey, we've been doing this for thousands of years. You know? So that's something that's hard to break. The other thing is, if things are always done the same, it leads to stagnation, and lack of growth both growth for the individuals and growth for the uh, economy as a whole because things are always done the same our country has changed so much on our economy because it's so dynamic new ideas new people all the time different countries continually change it so things have continued to grow and a lot of these countries have stagnated so that's a traditional economy now if we go back and we talk about what about a communist or command economy what is something that's very uh, a good strength of it and this the first one actually comes from uh, world studies back uh, kind of between world war one and world war two and we're talking about the soviet union we're talking about russia what were they able to do what was the strength of that command communist system at that time well stalin we're talking about looks around at europe england especially the united states and what's going on economically 
well, we're in the middle of, you know, kind of the industrial boom, right? Things are the industrial revolution. Most people in the Soviet Union, they're farmers. So Stalin decides we're going to change. It took the United States, you know, 100, 150 years to go from 1776 to the Industrial Revolution because it was slow change as different people came up with ideas. Well, Stalin didn't want to wait. So he came up with, does anybody remember? The five-year plan. We are going to change. We're going to become an industrialized nation in five years. It really didn't happen in five years. Had to come up with a second five-year plan. But one of the strengths of a command economy is it's capable of dramatic change in a short time. It took us a long time to change the United States, but they're capable because he ordered and commanded everybody, we're going to change and we're going to do this. Now, the second strength is, uh, it's not even really mentioned, I don't think, in your book. My students years ago came up with it, and it's actually really good. Um, the question I would have for you is, do you know the only time in U.S. history when more people left this country than came to this country. It was the Great Depression. Things are going really bad here. And 100,000 Americans, if you can believe it, 100,000 Americans left the United States and went to the Soviet Union. Why? Why would you leave here and go to the Soviet Union? Well, the second thing is, you're guaranteed a job. It's the government's responsibility to find you a job. And most of you probably, at this point in your life, haven't you know, understood this at all because you haven't gone, gone through it. But being without a job, besides the monetary issues and financial issues, like right now with the coronavirus, it's actually a psychological issue too because it's depressing. One time I was without a job for about three months after I left, or UPS let me go as I was a temporary, and it took them three months before they called back and I got the permanent job, but it was depressing. Even though my wife was working and money was coming in, it's depressing not having a job. And do you remember the movie that we watched in government that talked about this? He did a great job of explaining this. The movie Dave. After Dave fired his chief of staff, he went and gave a press conference where he said, I fired you know, Bob Alexander. And he talked about the problems the country had. And he said, you know, one thing I think I would like to do is make it the responsibility of the government to find a job for everyone who wants one. Now, whether you believe that's their job or not, that's totally different. But what he said after that is really true. He said, have you ever seen the look on somebody's face the day they finally get a job. It looks like they could fly. And it doesn't have anything really to do with the paycheck. It has to do with doing something valuable with your day. Do you understand why people would leave the United States and go to the Soviet Union during the Depression? Because they had a job. They woke up each day and they had something valuable to do. And they thought that was much better than just sitting around and not having a job here because unemployment in the depression was 25%. So guaranteeing a job is a real advantage. Now, what about the disadvantages? If you'll notice, there are five disadvantages. But when you look at the market economy, we have six advantages. So from our perspective, of course, if we talk to them, they probably would, you know, North Korea would say they have the advantage, but we believe that we do. So what are the disadvantages? The first thing is a command economy does not meet, whoops, I didn't even write that correctly, does not meet the needs and wants of the people.
It doesn't meet the needs and wants of the people. If you talk about North Korea and ask the question, what do they spend most of their money on? You should know it's the military. In a communist system, as we talked about way back at the beginning of government, how could Stalin and Mao and Hitler, how could they kill all those people? It's because people aren't important. The country's what's important. So if people aren't important, they're really not going to make goods and services for the people. The second thing is it lacks incentives for workers. It lacks incentives for workers. If you're in a command economy and if you go to work and you work really extremely hard, are you going to get a raise? Or are you going to get a promotion? No, because they control everything. So why should you work so hard? So many times the things that came out of the command economy, out of like the Soviet Union, they weren't made that well because there's no incentive to do a great job. Here, you do a great job because you can get a promotion, get a raise, move up in the company, all those things. That's why you work hard. The third thing that it lacks is it, or the problem is it requires a large resource consuming bureaucracy. Requires a large resource consuming bureaucracy. Remember bureaucracy is that kind of negative word, all those different branches or those different departments and agencies. Well, in a command economy, they're going to tell you where to work, what to make, how many to make, what the cost is. And they need to do that for everyone. So they have to have some government agency that keeps track and makes sure everybody's doing what they've been told. And that consumes a lot of the resources. In the United States, there's nobody here telling Apple how many uh, you know, phones to make. There's nobody telling General Motors how many cars to make. So we don't have a, a big bureaucracy that we have to consume all these resources to keep track of that. The fourth thing is there's little flexibility to deal with small day-to-day -day problems. <clears throat> Little flexibility to deal with small day-to-day -day problems. <clears throat> now, if I was to take this piece of paper and you know do one of my great drawings of, you know, here's the Soviet Union. And we'll put Moscow here. So if you have this huge country, if there's a little problem economically in this town, and there's one in this town, and this town, and this town, and this town, can Moscow, who's making all the decisions for everyone, can they deal with small day-to-day -day issues? No, because they're trying to deal with everyone. The only kinds of decisions and rules they can make are kind of the one size fits all. Every, we're going to make this rule, it applies to everyone, even though it can't really take into account what's going on in this little town, or in this factory, or in this factory here. They can't do that. So they can't really deal with small day-to-day -day problems. The fifth thing is uh, new and different ideas, new and different ideas are discouraged. New and different ideas. Whoops, sorry, I wasn't even there for you to read. New and different ideas are discouraged because everyone is treated exactly the same. There's really no individuality. The government's saying and you're doing what they're saying. Okay? So there's five. Many of these disadvantages here, the command economy, are actually the advantages of our type of economy. So we'll do the advantages of a market economy. First thing, able to change gradually. 
we're able to change gradually economically. What that means usually that when somebody invents something, somebody else comes along, makes a small improvement than somebody else and then somebody else. And so that means the products are usually very good or become better and better and better because somebody's always looking for a way to improve and we gradually change. We gradually change from you know, farming to industrial to now technological and informational. The second thing is individual freedom for everyone. Individual freedom for everyone. You get to make your decisions. You know, where do you want to go to school? Do you want to go to school? Do you want to go to work right away? Where do you want to work? What state do you want to live in? What kind of job do you want? To... You get to make all those decisions yourself. The third thing is there is a notable lack of government interference. There's a notable lack of government interference in the economy. Now, we can actually talk about that's been changing. I mean, the government over the last 20, 30 years has been involved more and more, more rules, more regulations. You can even talk about this stimulus bill that they just passed. And inside of it, there are other things that they passed, put in there. Remember, as writers, remember we said on a bill that's going to pass, they attach things to it that don't have anything to do with helping Americans and the economy. They added all these other pet projects on and are they going to be temporary? Or is this a way for the government to grow and interfere more and more? I'm a little bit afraid that it might be more interference and the stimulus bill doesn't designate whether these added things are temporary or permanent, which could be a problem. The fourth thing is decentralized decision making decentralized decision making I can grab out here we go Mr. Johnson's great drawings again let's do the same thing we can do this a little bit we'll make you know, New England and there's Florida and little Texas and California. Oh, that's ugly. But here's Washington, D.C. back here. What's great about our system is we don't want Washington, D.C. to make decisions. We said, remember about Roseville. They don't know what's going on over here. Why does our economic system work better? Remember federalism or the division of power? We want Roseville not only to make governmental decisions for Roseville. We want Roseville to make economic decisions for Roseville. We want California to make economic decisions for California because we're all different. The government, it's not a good thing for them to make one size fits all because there are so many different people, different regions, different needs across the country. So it's a good thing that we have decentralized decision making. The fifth thing, that's a positive, that's a strength, is the incredible variety of goods and services. The incredible variety of goods and services. In a command economy, remember, they, people don't count, they don't really matter, so they don't make that much for them. But in the United States, because individuals are important, and we'll talk about it a little bit later maybe, but we rule the economy. What we want as consumers is what they're going to try to make. What we don't want, they stop making. So there's an incredible variety of goods and services. If you're going away to school, let's say, as an example, and you wanna have some kind of stereo for your room, well, think about your choice. Well, do I go online or do I try to go to a store when they're open? You know, when they come back open, you can go in the store. Let's say you decide to go to Best Buy and you go inside. First thing you got to decide is, okay, what kind of stereo? What brand do I want? After you pick the brand and you have to go and you get to pick what model, what features and everything. There's an incredible variety of goods and services 
which leads to the last point, the advantage of a market system is there's a high degree of consumer satisfaction. There's a high degree of consumer satisfaction. We are fairly satisfied with all the stuff we have. I mean, like we talked about before, if you go to many countries, you go to their grocery store and they have a section with cereal. We have an aisle of cereal. I mean, we have so many different things to choose from. We're fairly satisfied. If, if consumers aren't satisfied, then someone will try to meet that dissatisfaction. They'll try to make something to meet the needs and wants of the people. Now, what about our uh, disadvantages, our weaknesses? The first one is our system only, it rewards only productive resources. Our system only rewards productive resources. And we talk about resources, you should always go back to what are those? Land, labor, capital, entrepreneurship. The easiest thing to remember is in this one is if you're too old or too young or maybe too sick, you can't work. So therefore, you don't reap the reward. You don't get any money. Our system doesn't account for that. The second thing is we must guard against, this is just on number two, must guard against market failures. Sorry, I'll squeeze that in. Must guard against market failures. There are some times our system can fail and we've got to prevent and try to work and prevent those things from happening. There are three here. There are actually five. We'll add the other two later on when we talk about chapter seven. But these three are really, really important. A market failure. Uh, one thing we, for our system to work, it must be reasonably competitive. For our system to work, we have to guard against monopolies and things that stifle competition. We need at least two different companies all making similar, very similar or the same product. And you'll see that in uh, chapter two, sections two and three, when you're going through the book and watching the short little video, we must have competition. The second thing that we must uh, kind of guarantee is that resources must be free to move. Resources must be free to move. If they're not, that's a market failure. And once again, when that word resources comes up, your mind should automatically go to land, labor, capital, entrepreneurship. In this one, we're saying if you don't like your job, you must be free to quit and go somewhere else. If you're not, then our market system fails. If you own a business and you're using land, labor, and capital, and you're the entrepreneur, if things aren't going well, as the entrepreneur, you should be able to take your resources, the other three, land, labor, and capital, and make something else. If you can't, then our market system fails. And the third thing we must have, let's see, put it, must have adequate information. We must have adequate information. If we don't have good information, our market system fails. What do I mean? Well, let's say your car needs new tires. And so you go to the close, the only store that you know that's selling tires and you walk in and tell them, I want the cheapest tire you have. And they say, here it is, $150 a piece. And you go, okay, whatever. And you pay them, you know, $700 after all the, the fees and disposal and stems and all that. If you did not have the information that 10 miles away, another store is selling the same tire for $50 a piece, then our system fails. 
for competition, all this to work, you have to have the information out there. The, the last thing, number three, and this is kind of, I think it was one that we added also, and it's kind of opposite the strength of the uh, command economy. Number three, you're not guaranteed a job. You're not guaranteed a job. Jobs are competitive. Uh, we have to compete. You have to get training and schooling and whatever you need. But jobs in our economy, nobody guarantees you a job. If they do, then we're talking about a command economy is guaranteeing people work. Now, <clears throat> those are the three different types of economies there are in the world. Traditional, command, and market. Now, at the bottom of your paper, you should notice it says, what are the two ways you can tell what economic system a country has? And we can actually put, what are the two questions you can ask? You can ask two questions. And when you answer these questions, it helps you identify what kind of economy a country has. And this is something we have already talked about, like the very, not the first day, well, yeah, maybe the first day, second day in the lecture. The first question you can ask is, who owns the FOP? Who owns the factors of production? So if you say, well, the individuals own the factors of production, the land, then that's going to be a market economy. If you say, who owns the factors of production, you say the government, well, then you know you have a command economy where they own everything. And uh, traditional is a little bit harder. It depends on, you know, sometimes areas of the country. Um, because like in Kenya, you know, they're, you know, government owns some stuff and people own some. So it depends. The second question is actually the best. Who answers the three basic questions? Who answers, whoops, off the page, who answers the three basic questions? <clears throat> and if you remember, hopefully you do, but the three basic questions, what to produce, how to produce, and for whom to produce. So if you ask those questions, let's say we ask, okay, uh, what are we gonna produce? what they tell us. How are we going to produce it? How they tell us. And for whom are we going to produce? For whoever they tell us. You know you have a command economy. If you ask, uh, what are we going to produce? What we've always produced. How are we going to produce it? The same way we've always done it. For whom are we going to produce? For the same group. You know you have a traditional economy. Then when you get to you know, the last one, what are we going to produce? Whatever we want. How are we going to produce it? However we want. And for whom are we going to produce? For whoever we want. Then you know you have a market economy. Now, ours is a market economy. North Korea is a command economy. Uh, some European countries will talk about it. They have kind of a, a little bit of socialism in there where the government owns some stuff. Maybe heavy, big industries and people can own other stuff. But is any country in the world 100% one of these types of countries, economies? Are we purely market? Do we have some instances of command and do we have some tradition? Yes, we do. So at the bottom, the one thing you can put down is most countries have what we would call mixed economies. Mixed economies. Our economy is market, but we have little instances of government, right? Command, where they're telling us and setting standards and blah, blah, blah. And in tradition, we have some areas of the country where they still th do things, you know, maybe by tradition. It's been passed down. It's handmade, that kind of stuff. So most of them are mixed. Well, actually, all of them are mixed, but you would say... Our number one dominant thing is we have a market economy. So hopefully that helps you understand economies of the world a little bit. 
and we're done with that. I do have one final thing that I would like to add to the notes that you're going to be doing for um, sections two and three of chapter two. And it has to do with capitalism when you do the definition of that and look at capitalism. Because capitalism is one of the big things that differentiates us from command and socialism. Because in capitalism, we own the factors of production. We own the land, labor, capital, entrepreneurship. What are the advantages of our system of capitalism and disadvantages? Okay. So the first thing I want to say is an advantage of the capitalist system is that capitalism results in the best products for the best prices. Usually you always want two companies competing and when you do, when you have that competition in capitalism, you always get two, those two things I just said, but we'll say it in a different way. We get lower prices and better quality because one company is making it, another company starts and they make it a little better. Well, if this company doesn't make theirs better, then this one gets all the profit. And so they compete. If one lowers the price, the other one lowers the price too. So you have this competition back and forth and we benefit from that. The second thing it gives is um, it's good for an, uh, economic growth. And there's this little intrinsic uh, advantage that we get because of what we call innovation because people are always competing and in capitalism, you want to make a profit. So they're always trying to come up with new ideas for new products and new services. That's innovation. Um, so those are two really great advantages. Two of the disadvantages are one of them we already said is that you're not guaranteed a job. There's nobody out there guaranteeing you a job like in a command economy. The government's not providing something like socialism wants to give people things, but we don't have that. So that's a disadvantage. The other one is like we mentioned in the chart, it doesn't really um, reward anybody who has no competitive skills. You have to have skills in order to be able to get a job. If you're too old, we said, or too young or sick, or if you don't have any skills, that's why you need to get something beyond high school. Normally, you need to go to trade school, go to the military, or go to college. One of those things because you need skills to be able to command a better price in the market for your labor, which is your pay, your wages. So if you have something in your possession, and we'll talk about this later too, in chapter eight, is if you have a you know, diploma, if you have a certificate, if you have something that you can show that signals, and it's called signaling theory, it signals to your boss, I should be paid more because of training, experience, and things I have. That's what um, you have to do in our economy. If you don't have skills, our system doesn't really reward you. That's why you've got to get something else. You can't live on minimum wage. It wasn't meant for you to live on. It was an introductory wage to get you into the market where you could gain skills and experience so that you could command a greater um, a wage in the market. So those are two things I want you to add into, uh, I think it's, it's chapter two, section three, where it talks about capitalism. There's some questions there for you to fill that in. So hopefully you're having a good time, you're surviving, and hopefully you're getting outside, and the weather today turned pretty nice, so hopefully you're getting some exercise and getting out and doing things and not stuck in front of a screen. So uh, we'll talk again. Thanks, and have a great day.